There's a common judgment about writing that often gets trotted out and attributed to George Orwell. It says, good prose should be transparent like a window pane. If you search for the sentence, you'll get many results. It's reproduced endlessly by websites specializing in motivational nuggets of wisdom. It's quoted in legal articles. Many books have reprinted it. All this, despite the fact that he didn't ever say or write it at all. Well, not quite like that anyway. If you look at George Orwell's essay, Why I Write, from 1946, you'll find that he did indeed compare good prose to a window pane, but did so in a rather different context, and one which might imply a moral underpinning to the adage. Although he did advocate for clarity and minimalism in writing, and although many critics have described his writing as styleless, George Orwell is not the enemy here. In fact, I'm not really interested in Orwell at all, but rather in challenging the idea that clarity and simplicity of style are the necessary hallmarks of good writing. Instead, I want to talk about the beauty that is to be found in its opposite, that is, in convolution. In the incredible book Neo Decadence Twelve Manifestos, which is edited by one of my favourite contemporary writers, Justin Isis, the text Against Neo Passeism addresses this particular idea. Its writers claim, style is not and never can be a pane of glass. Linguistic associations constitute their own reality, not separate from or subordinate to other subjective experiences of everyday life. Our lives are inside novels and poems as much as novels and poems are objects in our lives. Honest use of language is always and only ever propaganda. We exalt the sticky, gummy, constructive and viral character of words. For my own part, I have little interest in transparent or anemic literary styles. As a reader, I want to have a conscious relationship with language. I want to notice it, to wade through it. I want an author's language to enter my bloodstream, to wage malicious cellular warfare inside my body. I want it to split my skull and leave me to bleed out on the pavement. Language can be consciousness altering. I want it to inebriate me, to distort, to transfigure and transmute. If style must be glass, let it be stained glass, sun comprehending glass, or unformed and white hot in the glass blower's crucible, still malleable under the bellows breath. I'm aware, of course, that convolution, in a certain degree, can lead to amusingly incomprehensible sentences like the following one from critic and all-round man of letters, George Saintsbury, which has entered my personal pantheon of prolixity. But while none, save these of men living, had done or could have done such things, there was much here which, whether either could have done it or not, neither had done. I'm aware too that the ungainly Anglo-Saxon bones poke through the flesh of modern English in pronoun-heavy sentences like, was that what that was? But I do think there's a depth and beauty to convolution when handled by writers who make of it a virtue in their style. If we take a moment to consider the etymology of the word convolution, we might be able to shed some of its pejorative connotations or at least reconsider some of its potential meanings. Convolution is etymologically derived from the Latin verb convolvere, which means to roll together. It's morphologically interesting too. The vol morpheme of the word comes from the Proto-Indo-European root well, which is also found in the words evolve, vault as in to vault over, in the hell of helicopter and helix in waltz, even in the verb to well, as in to rise, gush, or spring. The idea of rolling together might allow us to think of a compression of information or a densely packed manner of writing, but many of the related words that I listed are also related to momentum, liveliness, and change. 
We might think about convolution as something that allows language to stretch and transform, to levitate, to jump, or even to dance. With this in mind, I want to think about three writers that push convolution to its limits and employ it in order to achieve unique and transcendent effects. The first writer I want to talk about is someone whose work I'd like to discuss in greater detail in the future. John Cooper Powys is a writer of enormous imaginative power, given to composing sprawling, gargantuan novels overflowing with mythic resonance, with unorthodox ideas and peculiar imagery, all woven together by a host of voluptuously sinuous sentences. In the longest of his Wessex novels, A Glastonbury Romance, which is well over a thousand pages, this tendency is announced in the very first paragraph, which introduces one of his major themes, that is the coalescence and communion between universe, fate, and consciousness. He writes, At the striking of noon on a certain 5th of March, there occurred within a causal radius of Brandon Railway Station, and yet beyond the deepest pools of emptiness between the uttermost stellar systems, one of those infinitesimal ripples in the creative silence of the first cause, which always occur when an exceptional stir of heightened consciousness agitates any living organism in this astronomical universe. Something passed at that moment, a wave, a motion, a vibration, too tenuous to be called magnetic, too subliminal to be called spiritual, between the soul of a particular human being who was emerging from a third-class carriage of the 1219 train from London and the divine diabolical soul of the first cause of all life. In this passage, the convolution, the coiling clauses, are the connective tissue that bind together two planes of existence, one distinctly earthbound and drab, the other all-encompassing and transcendent. Powers's sentences allow the reader to plunge down from vertiginous heights and soar up again, to journey rapidly between orders of magnitude. Later in the novel, Powys burrows down deeper still, taking in the resonating emotions of beings, even on a microbial scale. While the Welshman sat on that damp heap of turnips and bit with ferocious and yet hardly conscious impulse into the flesh of one of the rankest and most astringent turnips in the heap, spitting out each mouthful after he had chewed it and once more plunging his teeth into the sharp-smelling substance, it happened that a microscopic creature, all mouth and yet all belly, was enjoying or suffering from precisely the same twinge of egocentric mania as were Mr. Evans and the First Cause as it lay coiled up upon the surface of this same vegetable. Malcolm Lowry's untamed, sun-drenched descent into the hellish depths of alcoholism under the volcano from 1947 employs its convolution to an altogether different effect. The close third-person narrator is bolted to the consciousness of the consul, a figure weighed down by addiction, whose life and grip on reality are crumbling and who spends the novel stumbling from bar to bar in a small Mexican town. His thoughts flow, interrupt one another, split themselves into manifold viewpoints to fold in upon each other once more. Take the opening sentence of chapter three, which Michael Schmidt calls torturous in his introduction to the novel. The tragedy, proclaimed as they made their way up the crescent of the drive, no less by the gaping potholes in it than by the tall exotic plants, livid and crepuscular through his dark glasses, 
perishing on every hand of unnecessary thirst, staggering, it almost appeared, against one another, yet struggling like dying voluptuaries in a vision to maintain some final attitude of potency, or of a collective desolate fecundity, the consul thought distantly, seemed to be reviewed and interpreted by a person walking at his side, suffering for him, and saying, regard, see how strange, how sad, familiar things may be. Touch this tree, once your friend, alas, that that which you have known in the blood should ever seem so strange. To spend time in the circumlocutory company of this consciousness is to take deep draughts of both beauty and poison. It is convolution as powerful intoxicant. Michael Schmidt characterizes this rolling together in architectural terms. He says, This is not the natural, if rather fussy, elaboration of Henry James, whose longest sentences retain some contact with the speaking and feeling voice. This is syntax as architecture, a strained high baroque. It is not to be understood so much as unpacked and paraphrased. It is vertical, balanced, stilled in time, not horizontal in flow. Though I agree with much of what Schmidt says, rather than constructing domes in air, Lowry's prose often builds downwards, burrowing into the cavernous regions of the psyche and becoming lost in its depths. The final writer I want to talk about is not a writer of prose, but a poet. Stephen Watts published a long poem across two volumes in the late 2000s, Mountain Language and Journey Across Breath. The poem takes the form of a letter, or a scroll as Watts himself puts it, addressed to a grandfather he never knew, who lived in a small mountain village in northern Italy and died 30 years before Watts was born. Watts's language is never still, but hurtles under the power of its own clausal propulsion system through time and space, from subject to subject. The reader is carried along on its sunward flight by a breathless and ceaseless energy. I'm going to present a rather lengthy excerpt from the poem, which I think is necessary to feel the full weight of Watts's style, the recording is from a reading that Watts gave at the Native Spirit Festival in 2010. I'll put a link in the description so that you can hear the whole reading for yourselves if you want to. No, no, didn't you love trees as much as I love trees? I'm sure you must have. You must have walked up beyond Canair, up Gran Viso, and gone through thinning trees and least till the last few remained stormed in late spring by white horses. Look, this is a matter of meditation, of meditation where time stands still and whole worlds can be sucked in or out of white and black holes. This is what history is, not the batter of commerce, not the mass murder of innocence, not the constraint of hope by injunction. Trees turn into people and people turn into trees as surely as a sleeping man. Haven't you seen high spruce bent slightly in the wind in the final meadows near the tree line? How they sway and soak into bone and skin, how they moan and dance into blood and heart, how the ball is like a tower of blood and bone is meshed into the memory of bar Dear heart, we destroy trees at our own peril. Or can I describe for you a circle of sycamores? How their great ball of air swirls and dances. How they're always smaller, becoming arms and branches, capillary themselves in the fortunate air. Or in the old oaks and blackthorn or a single lost tree beside the Thames, or the superb deciduous woods in Easter Ross, or the spring festival in Glen Lyon. I once stood up through the roof of a car, moving slowly through an avenue of old larch in West Lothian. I once was mesmerized by a single white thorn at a junction of the Ockhill Hills. I once was unable to leave sight of a single stately 
home oak, and I'm talking now just of the trees of one island. Think of the trees in the Alps, or those trees by the railway in Satyajit Rai, or the flayed riverine memory of Ritvik Guttak and others in places you've never been able to go. One time, no, no, I lived three years on an island without trees, and it was beautiful, an island and a moorland and a bandaged sun. Always a bandaged sun and a moorland made from decayed trees, a shepherd's cloak of peat laid out on scoured ancient rock across a skyline of mountains, on schists cooled from the heat of magmas, on little protuberances amid the rocking seas, our history a seat beneath a bandaged sun, from galaxy to gale tuck, from binary code to biter, veins and capillaries mapped in the skies, models of life in the code of a leaf, the colours of butterfly wings more complex even than our eyes. That is why, Nono, that is why it all matters. You're being born in the mountains and then you're leaving the mountains and your life in the city with all the global messinesses in between. If I write these things in both joy and despair, it may be because I've not eaten enough these days, months. Please forgive me. On first hearing this poem read by Stephen Watts, I was stunned by its incantatory power. I had that rare feeling when the reading was done of coming to or re-entering the world I had left utterly for its duration. For me, that power came partially from its imagery, but also from its ceaseless coiling and circling, that piling up of propulsive clauses. In other words, from its glorious convolution. I hope I've shown that convoluted style is more like a transfiguring lens than a window pane, and that it offers such an image as we might see watching the stars through a telescope or observing the jostling of cells through a microscope, and in perhaps sacrificing a little clarity, allows us to see further and deeper into the life of things. There are certainly other undisputed champions in all weight divisions of convolution. I might have mentioned, for instance, the circular and dithyrambic contortions of Thomas Bernhardt's prose, or the elaborate classical poise of Henry James's psychological portraits, or even, for instance, the language of Virginia Woolf, which is like a bird in flight, momentarily alighting in one character's mind before taking wing again to land in another's. But let me know in the comments if there are writers who you think use convolution to great effect. I'd love to hear your ideas. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.